look, I wanted to take the chance again, Tim, just to say thank you for for helping or doing this with me. These all themes we've been discussing themes that come out of, came out in my book, which is called Architecture of Power, about the architect Nicholas Hawksmoor, who was the only uh, apprentice of Nicholas of Christopher Wren, and um, he was charged with building churches and as a, as a result there's quite a lot of his writing is about religion you could say and really I think there's something very interesting that clearly he came across which is in his time I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Jesus like a bloke walking around in you know Israel Palestine performing miracles as a as a or even just a person walking around Israel Palestine just teaching peace, a man called Jesus doing that, not pretending for a moment, he, you know, in this version of events, you don't pretend for a moment that he had any kind of divine powers, but just the fact that there was a bloke called Jesus walking around preaching peace, you could say, in Israel-Palestine at the time. That's Jesus versus Christ, which is this sort of a much bigger concept, not a man, but an intermediary between like people and God or something like that. So you've got this sort of dynamic, Jesus an historical character versus Christ, uh, a sort of an almost super superhero type figure. Anyway, Jesus versus Christ, why Hawksmoor built weird churches. At the end, going to go back and have a look at probably the weirdest church in the world, which was his. Uh, and hopefully this little chat will sort of put that in context for you. Um, so someone who pops up a lot in Hawksmoor's life is this guy, Henry Aldrich. He was famous for producing a translation uh, of the history of a guy called Josephus. Talk about Josephus a little bit more in a minute. But Henry Aldrich very quickly was a very establishment figure. He studied the same school as uh, Christopher Wren, uh, the Westminster School. He was clearly a committed Protestant. Um, when he went to Oxford, Oxford at that time was being kind of run by Catholics under James II. Henry Aldrich helped re-establish Protestant control over Oxford and he fought with what was called the Catholic faction at Oxford. So you can see he's a, an establishment Tory, but very definitely a Protestant. So in 1700, what he was most famous for, or what's most relevant here, is he produced the genuine works of Flavius Josephus, the his, Jewish historian, translated from the original Greek according to Haberkamp's accurate edition. And I've highlighted the words genuine and accurate because this work by Josephus, this history of the of his era, had been severely edited and played with and rewritten over the hundreds of years uh, since it was first published. Really quickly, Henry Aldrich translated it from Greek into Latin and not English. Now, he did that because basically Latin was the, the language of the upper classes. And if you... If he had translated it into English, anyone could have read and understood what this translation actually said. And that was not the agenda. The agenda was to keep it very much amongst the, uh, you know, the cognoscenti, the people who've gone to Oxford, Cambridge and knew Latin. Um, so although it caused a sensation, this translation, it was only amongst the sort of upper classes, the Latinate classes. The original history by Josephus uh, was written in Greek. Um, that was despite Josephus being Jewish, so you could say he probably write in Hebrew, or, and he was writing in Rome, so you might expect him to write in Latin, but he didn't. Uh, he wrote it in Greek to kind of the purpose of his history and the purpose of his writing really was to introduce Judaic culture to the greater Roman Empire, the sort of Hellenized um, Eastern Mediterranean, where you know all the Greek and Roman gods were pretty much. Or very very similar here's this brand new culture being introduced with their monotheism and their history and their culture this is very much why josephus wrote it in greek uh, so everyone greek was the sort of you know the language everyone could read yeah so a uh, book that was originally uh, written in greek was translated into latin and you'll see um, why this was so this is worth talking about it's very interesting uh, so it's, this is the guy whose work was translated. This is Josephus. He started out, you could say, at the beginning of this story as a Jewish general and ended up as a Roman historian. 
He lived from 37 to roughly uh, 100 AD and was part of the aristocratic setup in, in Jerusalem built based around the temple. Uh, you know, the temple had been there for a while, been destroyed a couple of times, rebuilt. It was the centre of Jewish culture, you could say. Now, in the run-up to him becoming a general, there'd been attempts by the Romans to put statues of Caesar into the temple and to really uh, extract taxes from the Jewish population that they just weren't prepared uh, to accept. So after uh, sort of things built up, uh, the Jews in Jerusalem destroyed the Roman garrison there. And I think it was in the year 65, might have been the year 66, but they knew trouble was coming, the Jews. The, you know, the people of Jerusalem knew trouble was coming because they had destroyed and killed a, a whole Roman garrison over this dispute over taxes and where, where, where statues could go and all of that sort of thing. Because he was an aristocrat, I'm going to say, uh, Josephus was made the sort of leader of the, of the northern army, the army to the north of Jerusalem. And, uh, yeah, uh, in came Vespasian, uh, at that time a, a general under the uh, being asked to go there by the Emperor Nero to quell the rebellion. Vespasian turns up and de just decimates the, the Jewish army, the northern army that Josephus is uh, you know, leading. They just get completely slaughtered. So Josephus later tells this story about himself. Now bear in mind, he's an historian who su survived these events. But he tells this story. It's, it's quite, uh, quite amazing. The Jewish northern army was decimated they were you know they were they had no option but to surrender really but rather than do that Josephus and 40 of the leaders of the army he says went off to this cave where he says he suggested everyone take turns in killing each other and committing suicide and that sort of thing because that would be better than being tortured and and you know uh, when they captured and enslaved by the Romans so Josephus goes in with these 40 leaders to this cave makes the suggestion they all draw lots and he says, like, miraculously, he was the last man standing. Everyone else had committed suicide or stabbed each other. And he, you know, he saw all these people dead. And then he decided, you know what, I'm not going to do this. And he walked out the cave. So that's a story he t tells about himself and how he survived when everyone else in the Jewish army pretty much was either slaughtered or enslaved. He found his way into the presence of the Roman general Vespasian, who just killed thousands of his uh, fellow, fellow citizens. And he, 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 again, this is what he says happened, and this is what's written in the official history. Uh, this guy, Josephus, looks at Vespasian and goes, you know what, you are the Jewish Messiah that, you know, people for hundreds of years have been prophesizing would come. You are not just going to be the Jewish Messiah, you're also going to be the Roman Emperor. So this is in the year 668, and within a couple of years, all of that happens. So that was quite a remarkable <laughs> Prophecy, quite, quite an astute guess on Josephus' his part, um, you know, having just stepped out of a cave where he, 39 of his mates had committed suicide. He was having a hell of a day, uh, walked up, met the future Roman emperor and said, you know what, you're not just going to be the emperor, you're going to be the Jewish messiah that, you know, all the prophets have foretold. Later, a couple of years later, he... Um, Josephus joins in the siege and the eventual destruction of Jerusalem with Titus, who was Vespasian's son. So the father's son, Vespasian and Titus, are going to hear a lot more about them. They were the Flavian family, family and they became the imperial family. After the destruction of the temple at Jerusalem and all that, which we'll come back to, Josephus went to Rome, uh, became a, a Roman citizen, and called himself Flavius Josephus. The Flavian name is one you'll get used to watching this. And he wrote the definitive history of the era. So he, like I said, he was born in 37, died in 100, but the, the whole sort of 200 years really, or yeah, about that prior to his life, he covered in very, very fine detail. He, he sort of wrote this history so people could understand, the, the sort of Hellenized Roman Empire could understand why the Jewish rebellion had happened and he obviously did it he was writing in Rome for the Romans he did it with a you know a, a Roman bias to it you could say so although he wrote the definitive history of the Jewish people in that era um, and you know uh, 
a very accurate history by all accounts, uh, you know, re relative to a lot of others. His work was never translated into Hebrew. The um, Jewish community did not like him. It seems he was probably viewed as a traitor and you'll, you can kind of understand why. But he was certainly a survivor, Josephus. So there you go. Yeah, he lived 37 to 100, wrote a history, a very, very, the definitive history, very detailed history of about, uh, I'm going to say 200 years before his birth up to the, the time of the rebellion. And one of the things, what, the, the reason why um, Aldrich made his very genuine translation was because copies of Josephus, uh, you know, were around in everyone's libraries. It was a kind of a set text, if you like, or a very useful history. Lots of people had copies of it. And there were just, you know, over the years, for very obvious reasons, people had written in stuff that Josephus hadn't written written about Jesus Christ, about, you know, the man in the Bible. So, for example, this is a classic one. This is what you'd find in a, a Catholic version of Josephus's history at this time. They'd just say, oh, yeah, there was a Jesus and he was a good bloke. And, pilot. you know, it just the story happened. But, and there are, you know, in different versions of jo Josephus' history, there's all kinds of forged quotes and interpolations, and they kept on trying to slip Jesus slip Jesus into the history, Jesus Christ, you know, of Nazareth and all of that. But actually in the real, the, 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 the Henry Aldrich translation, uh, Jesus of Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, whatever you want to call him, this pacifist teacher who, you know, drew quite a crowd according to the Bible, uh, who was the kind of person Josephus would have written about had he been there and he just wasn't. There was a complete absence of Jesus of Nazareth, the pacifist teacher. But there was a, a plethora of made up bits and bobs that were clearly made up when you compared it to Henry Aldrich's latest translation, because none of this sort of stuff was, was, was in there. So the definitive history of the era that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was meant to be walking around doesn't mention him once. And if you're of a scientific you know, disposition, that's pretty pretty telling. In Josephus's book, Histories, I, I'm going to say I haven't read it all, I've read commentaries, um, it's massive and anyone wants to read it and get back to me with some, you know, I'd be grateful, but I'm not that really into the history of religion, uh, but I have read a couple of things um, that, if you like, by people who have read Josephus like commentaries. So um, it turns out in Josephus' history, there are 29 people who he mentions called Jesus, but not one of them like, is anything like a Christ figure. Um, you know, there's no, not, not even no walking on water, there's no pacifist leader on the scene, there's no one calling on people to turn the other cheek and lead this new kind of life, almost Buddhist kind of attitude that Jesus Christ of the New Testament introduces this sort of pacifist thing. There's no one like that at all anywhere in uh, Josephus' history. But there are this, some parallels, let's say, between Josephus' history and the, the, you know, the New Testament narrative we get about Jesus. This is one of the closest you know, crossover points, you could say. There's a guy called Jesus, the son of Emmaus, and he cries out, a voice from the east, a voice from the west, a voice from the four winds, a voice against Jerusalem and the holy house, a voice against the bridegrooms and the brides and a voice against this whole people. So he's sort of being, you know, uh, he's talking in parables or whatever, you know, like Jesus did. No matter how severely wicked, this Jesus simply repeats again and again, woe, woe to Jerusalem. Finally, he says, woe to myself also, and he is killed by a stone from the Roman artillery. That's pretty much a direct quote from um, Josephus's history. So there are people going around uh, saying woe, <laughs> uh, for what it's worth, and they're called Jesus. What's interesting about this and why, you know, people point this out is that in uh, Matthew chapter 23, Jesus lists seven woes. Woe to this person, woe to that person, seven different woes. And in Luke chapter 11, he has six woes. Um, woe to this person, woe, you know, um, everything's going to go wrong. Woe. So what I'm going to say is lots of, I'm going to say loose parallels between some of the stuff in the, the actual history and some of the stuff that then appears in the, the Gospels. And that 
those parallels go a little bit deeper and really there's one or two <laughs> very, very interesting ones, which I'm gonna show you now. People point out there are parallels between Jesus's, um, you know, mission after he, well, Jesus's mission once he's 30 or whatever, you know, once he's coming back and he's trying to preach and everything. There's parallels between him and the movements of Titus Flavius, who was the son of Vespasian. This guy, Titus, in the year 70, we mentioned this already, went around and just put the Jewish rebellion down. He was very, very, very effective at this. Um, yeah, so his, his sort of campaign started in the north. This is Titus's campaign. And there was a battle on the Sea of Galilee, and they ended up, the Romans, in their ships. Apparently, you know, uh, they not the Jews out their boats, whatever. I'm guessing the Romans had bigger boats. And apparently several hundred, maybe thousands of people were, were stabbed by the Romans using spears whilst they were in the water. The Romans just were going around and spearing them and letting them die. And this was quite a famous victory for Titus. And obviously, uh, well, there, there is the parallel in that well, the kind of quirk, almost like a yin and yang thing going on here. But Jesus famously started his mission at the, at the Sea of Galilee and says, well, yeah, we'll be fishers and men. So there's an interesting parallel there. Um, later, Jesus struggles with de demonic visions uh, near the River Jordan and some swine are drowned. In this particular instance, or this incident as it's described in the history, there seem to be some very weird parallels again between what Jesus is said to have done and what Titus actually did. Because he, you know, there was another battle and he pushed a load of the rebels into the river and they were drowned. And so there are dozens of these little parallels. I've brought out those two because I think they're well, they're easy to explain and you know, you know, don't need to know loads of details about the New Testament, but. This one's the absolute killer. I, I, I came across this and this, you know, it's one of those sort of pivot moments. You know, I, I think, I hope you find this interesting because it certainly changed my thinking on the whole, clarified what was going on with the whole Jesus thing for me. Really famously, uh, you know, Jesus and his uh, disciples are all in Jerusalem and J Jesus predicts the coming of what he calls the son of man, some kind of messianic figure. I'm going to show you Titus Flavius nails this. He fulfills Jesus's proper prophecy. I, if you look in the New Testament, there's a prophecy made by Jesus, supposedly about, you know, the year 33, let's say about then, that Titus Flavius fulfills. So Jesus Christ makes a prophecy, which a, a, the son of the Roman emperor at the time and the future Roman emperor completely fulfills, which is quite a remarkable linkage let's say between the uh, the new testament narrative and the actual historical reality so uh this is mark chapter 13 the fall of jerusalem and the temple you can read this if you want but um you know they're all there the disciples say oh isn't this a lovely town aren't these lovely buildings and jesus says there shall be not one stone left upon another um soon you shall see the ab 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 abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, staring where it ought not now. In brackets, let him that readeth understand. I don't know what that means, but that's like a nudge, nudge, wink, wink. I don't quite get what this abomination of desolation means as spoken of by the prophet, by prophet Daniel. But in other places in the Bible, for example, um, you know, when they go on about the beast having a number of his name, in brackets, let him that readeth understand. There's some kind of pun or double meaning going on that's probably lost in translation. It's certainly not lost on me. There's this passage, he calls on this abomin abomination of desolation to Jesus, whatever that means. You know, this is going to be a time of affliction uh, that was so, you know, it's the worst time since God created uh, the earth. It's, it's, this abomination is going to be abominable. Um, and then, you know, all, as all this destruction is happening, Jesus says, the Son of Man, will, they'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And verily, I say unto you, all, uh, this generation shall not pass until all these things are done. So within four, 30, 40 years of me saying this, all of this will happen. And it all does happen. Um, Jerusalem, I'll show you, it was, was laid waste completely. Uh, literally not one stone left on top of another. So 
it had been a few years since the uh, people of Jerusalem had, had destroyed and killed their Roman garrison. And in the year 70 AD, this is when Titus Flavius came and laid siege to Jerusalem, having sort of laid waste to the surrounding area. Uh, Jerusalem was a walled city, had been there for an awfully long time, and I guess most people <laughs> have heard of Jerusalem. What they did was they waited till, you got to figure this was deliberate, uh, Titus waited till Passover, and the city was filled with pilgrims, you know, for the, for the celebration of Passover. Josephus reckons in the end about 1.1 million people were killed, uh, 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 you know, as part of this siege. I don't know if he's exaggerating, but there are a lot of people there. And so it obviously made the town very crowded and there are an awful lot of mouths to feed. What's crazy is that whilst, you know, people had, um, you know, prepared, they'd strengthened the walls, they said there was 21 years worth of food stored in Jerusalem. You know, these people knew that trouble was coming and they'd made preparations, but right, you know, <laughs> In a way that maybe only religious religion can make people act. There are people who I'm going to just label zealots for the meantime. Were inside the city walls of Jerusalem, killing people who were trying to compromise, murdering appeasers, um, specifically anyone who was saying, "Oh, look, we could make a, a deal with the Romans, or we should try and talk this out." These zealots would go around, target them, and kill them because they wanted a fight. They want, They thought this was the end of days. You know, this is the prophesized time. If they have this battle, maybe the Messiah would appear, whatever. <laughs> they weren't thinking straight to the extent that, because they were, they wanted this collision. They wanted this kind of, you know, apocalyptic battle between them in Jerusalem, their holy city and the evil Romans. They actually tried to just, the zealots, uh, this broad category of people, tried to destroy all the food in Jerusalem to force people into fighting because they couldn't just sit there, you know, sit there and wait it out. So it's a crazy situation, very, very, very high stakes situation. Titus then had a wall built all the way around the city. So he walled in this walled city and over time began to break through the walls. The walls, uh, the walls of Jerusalem were very substantial. And there was, you know, that kind of tunneling that went on, people went under the, went under the foundations and tried to collapse different things. And I can't imagine the life and death or the, the, the you know the situation of actually fighting with people out underground in tunnels you've really really recently dug for the defense of your you know the foundations of your wall but this is a serious siege this kind of stuff happened eventually the romans broke through it happened in stages josephus is very detailed about it all the bit that's worth dwelling on here is he claims jews began the burning of the temple maybe by accident whatever but he totally tries to absolve, you know, he, he lets Titus wash his hands of the destruction of the temple, which was completely destroyed, not immediately, but everything in Jerusalem. They, they literally, they did destroy, and yeah, you know, as it said in the, uh, the, the New Testament, not one stone was laying on top of another. I think if the Romans saw two stones all together, they knocked them. They destroyed Jerusalem utterly. And, you know, happily for them, when they, when the temple burned down and they had a rummage around in the, um, in the basement, they found a load of money. And it's very hard to get uh, um, accurate figures on, but probably tons of gold and silver. I mean, the, you know, the temple of Jerusalem was extremely well, wealthy, I'm going to say. I'm going to say tons, certainly of silver, maybe slightly less than that gold but they 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 took a lot of cartloads of shekels back to rome part of this money was what they built the Colosseum with so you can see that it was a substantial um uh, a substantial treasure that they found there uh, people make all kinds of people speculate in all kinds of ways about what was down in the um basement of the temple of jerusalem there was definitely a lot of money there. Um, so, kind of remarkably, there's this fairly specific passage in the Bible I showed you about Jesus prophesizing the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, that the Son of Man is coming in. All of that is Titus. Titus is announced, you know, for anyone who's sort of historically literate, and certainly at the time, everyone would have understood that the bloke who did destroy Jerusalem and that Jesus called the son of man was Titus. So 
let's just carry on with this notion of the Flavians. Oh no, sorry, right. So I want to just before we do that, uh, talk to you about Titus's dad, Vespasian. As I said, he became emperor in sort of 69 or 70 AD, depending on how you count it. He was, <clears throat> uh, let's say, a lowborn, uh, not an aristocratic Roman by any stretch, family of mule traders, apparently. He must have risen through the ranks through ability as opposed to you know, nepotism. He's kind of famous for being very, very successful in his campaign in Britain when the Emperor Claudius ordered the invasion, uh, brought loads of elephants over to smash up the chariots. Um, some quite remarkable tactics and innovations they used to try and be more successful in Britain than Jesus Caesar had been. Vespasian sort of went along the south coast. It's not entirely, people disagree where the Romans landed, might have been sort of in Kent, might have been, uh, you know, um, more uh, around Southampton Way. Um, anyway, one way or the other, Vespasian took about and destroyed and enslaved the inhabitants of about 20 of those hill forts, you know, the Iron Age hill forts. The Romans have got pretty good at the, de dealing with those things in France. They never bothered to storm the place. They just bombarded it with sort of artillery, you know, catapults, burning stuff, you know, slingshot, I don't know. But it, he was kind of known to be a very successful artillery general, i.e. just sit a long way away and, and bombard the poor sods <laughs> into submission. And that's what happened uh, all the way along the south coast. Uh, he went as far as Exeter West and uh, founded a, you know, a garrison town there. He was very successful in his time uh, in Britain for the Emperor Claudius. Um, some 20 years later, he was made governor of the Africa province, which is sort of slightly uh, west of Egypt, sort of Tunisia and that kind of neck of the woods, or, or maybe more like Algeria, that neck of the woods. Anyway, he was sent to Africa province. Now, normally the governor of a province was, you're only there for one year and your job really was just to fleece the place of any, any wealth. You'd keep the local population down by robbing them blind. So governors would be sent, uh, the kind of people who would be sent would be like there to try and sort of sort out their retirement fund. So you've got one year to pillage the place. That's kind of how the, the Romans governed, just keep people poor. But he didn't do that. In this year, apparently, he didn't really rob the place blind, but he did make a lot of influential friends, um, which seems to me like he had ambitions for the future. If he was just like, you know, FIA, I've only got a year to make what I can. He'd have robbed the place like everyone else had. But he was noted, it was noted that he didn't do that, he treated the local sort of aristocracy with respect and won friends rather than made money. So, yeah, successful general, successful governor, you know, a guy moving up the, the pecking order, but not, um, not a Julian, not the um, same family as Nero or uh, Claudius, or in, and in no way related to Julius Caesar or Augustus. But um, he was sent to Judea by um, Nero because of the, the, the Jewish rebellion. And in the year uh, 68, for very, you know, Nero committed suicide. And there's what's called the year of four emperors. De different people all jumped on the imperial throne. I was going to go through them. It's not really that worth it. But at the end of the year, Vespasian was there. That's what you need to know. Now, when Nero committed suicide, Vespasian was in Israel, Palestine. And, um, you know, every other ambitious general was made a beeline for Rome to try and get on the throne. He didn't. He went to Egypt. And on the 1st of July, 1669, in Egypt, he was declared Roman emperor and also pharaoh, too, for good measure, I guess. And I want to show you this because this is trying to give you the context of who Vespasian was and quite what he, I think, what he got him and his family got up to. So Vespasian was proclaimed the son of the creator de deity Ammon <coughs> in the style of the ancient pharaohs. And this is the more interesting bit or relevant bit to us and an incarnation of Serapis in the manner of the Ptolemies. As Pharaonic president demanded, Vespasian just demonstrated his divine election by the traditional methods of spitting on and trampling a blind and crippled man and thereby miraculously healing him. We'll come back to this miraculous healing, but this is, you know, in Alexandria, in northern uh, Egypt, Vespasian had himself declared emperor there in 69. So this Serapis is not all that well known, but um, 
their Spazian had a vision, they say, when in Alexandria or whatever, uh, inspired by Serapis. And I think it comes clear what that, that vision, that idea was. So Serapis was a sort of made up God, a new God, a synthesis of um, the Apis bull and Osiris, but it was popularized by the Ptolemaic dynasties. So the people who came in after Alexander the Great, they kicked the Persians out of Egypt. Uh, they were there from about 320 something BC, the Ptolemies, and they, to sort of uh, make it let more palatable to the Egyptians that were being ruled by Greeks, they popularized this god Serapis, who sort of had Greek and Roman attributes. So everyone, you know, everyone could love Serapis because he was a bit of us and he was a bit of them. You know, it was a unifying figure. Yeah, the aristocrats of uh, Alexander were probably the wealthiest people in the world. There's some very famous and influential families there. They've been there for hundreds of years, literally in the bread basket of the Mediterranean. I mean, the, 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 uh, the Nile, <coughs> once it got sort of organized by the Ptolemies, I they enslaved a lot of people, but they kicked out a huge agricultural surplus and it was just absolutely vastly rich. And really, one of the things you could say uh, Vespasian did by going to Egypt was that just like, well, I'm, I'm, I've been declared emperor here. That means I've got all the food now. So if you want any food in Rome, you better consider the fact that I've just declared myself emperor in, em, emperor in Egypt and I've got my, my hand on the tap, if you like. Subsequent to you know, uh, Vespasian's vision of Serapis, Serapis appeared on Roman uh, coinage, Flavian coins. <clears throat> yeah, and it's just this idea, I think this is Vespasian's uh, you know, vision. You, you create a god and it makes people like each other. It gives people a unifying figure. And of course, well, not of course, but part of the job of being Roman emperor was you were Pontifex Maximus, the chief bridge builder, I, you, were, you were the chief priest of Rome. You know, the Rome, Romans are very clever, you know, clever with religion. They always try and incorporate people's religions and prejudices and stuff into their pantheon, try and be as agreeable religiously as possible, and sort of create, you know, links between cultures, between the cultures they dominated, you know, people, trying to make the people they enslaved feel included in the whole enterprise I guess you could say but the Roman emperor was the chief priest of Rome and Vespasian had this vision inspired by Serapis of a unifying figure who could everyone in the empire could love he wasn't he wasn't on anyone's side he was he was everyone's you know everyone's favorite yeah so <clears throat> Vespasian when he became emperor was Pretty into having, well, he was into book burning. We'll talk about that in a minute. But he was also into book writing. Uh, he was pretty clear. He was trying to establish and, you know, establish the legacy. So um, Tacitus was paid for by Vespasian. Said, um, the ha "This is going back to the first of July, sixty-nine. The hand was instantly restored to use, and the day again shone for the blind man." Both facts are told by eyewitnesses even now when falsehood brings no reward. So you can definitely trust that that definitely happened. Uh, Suetonius wrote, an ancient superstition was current in the East that out of Judea would come the rulers of the world. This prediction, as it later proves, <laughs> referred to the Roman emperors, but the Jews, who read it as referring to themselves, rebelled. Silly old Jews thinking their prophecy about ruling the world related to them. No, it didn't relate to the Romans. This is a particularly Roman phrase at the end of this. This mysterious prophecy had in reality pointed to the space and the of course it had. But the common people, as, as is the way of human ambition, interpret these great destinies in their own favour. And here's a particularly Roman phrase, and could not be turned to the truth even by adversity. So we couldn't even persuade them even when we hurt them. Josephus wrote, now this oracle certainly denoted the government of Vespasian, who was appointed emperor in Judea. This is, um, this is all there in very famous bits of history. Vespasian became the, was, uh, you know, appointed himself as Messiah, as world king. He adopted and he adapted the sort of Jew, Jewish prophecies about that. 
you can see uh, Josephus, we'll talk about that in a little bit more, was very helpful in this. But Vespasian, absolutely, he performed miracles. You know, what do you want? He's a, he's a genuine king. He, you know, he's a pharaoh. He's a, um, he's, a, he's a worshiper of Serapis. It's all good. So Vespasian has set himself up to be everyone's friend, ruler and messiah. Vespasian was the first, what's called Flavian emperor, it's his family that took over from the um, slightly mental family that had descended from Julius Caesar. And if you look at early Christian figures, um, <laughs> they're all Flavian, all of them. A guy called Titius Flavius Clemens was Vespasian's cousin, Flavia Domitilla, very, very, very early mentions in the Bible was Vespasian's wife. Berenice mentioned very in all those letters and stuff in the uh, New Testament, Vespasian's mistress or, or, or something like that. Clement the first, who, you know, they say uh, Peter was the Pope first, isn't it? The first historic Pope was Clement the first, and he was Vespasian's relative, either a nephew or something like that. You'll see if you go through a lot of the the early proponents, early bishops, the big movers and shakers in Christianity, Roman Christianity, the thing we all think of when we talk about early Christianity, they were all Flavians, every single one of them. This was a family business. They'd, Vespasian had had his vision, we would need a unifying figure at the heart of our religious and cultural life. Let's go Jesus. And so we'll talk about it a little bit more, but every single major figure in the early, early history of Roman Christianity was a Flavian, it was a family business. This is a quote, um, one guy who is very interesting about all this is a guy called Joseph Atwill, uh, at A-T Will, W-I-L-L. -L. Um, this is a quote from him, sort of nicely summary, summarizes it, I think. Um, this is not, he's not the only person who makes this argument. Jew, uh, Jewish sects in Palestine at the time who were waiting for a prophesied warrior messiah were a constant source of violent insurrection during the first century. When the Romans had exhausted, you know, they'd run out of ability to stab people, conventional means of crushing rebellion, they switched to psychological warfare. They surmised the way to stop the spread of zealous Jewish missionary activity was to create a competing belief system. That's when the peaceful messiah story was invented. Instead of inspiring warfare, this Messiah urged turn the other cheek passivism and encouraged Jews to give unto Caesar and pay their taxes to Rome. So early Christianity, you know, this this it was a Roman artifact to help pacify a very <laughs> warlike people. Yeah, and they weren't mucking about um, the Flavian suppression of the temple religion. So everything, you know, everyone was meant to go to the temple um, every year. It was it was a big business and they'd been running it for a long time and they just the romans just thought you know forget this we're going to destroy these people genocide whatever you want to call it it was very close to that um you know uh, josephus said 1.1 million people were killed uh, i i don't know where he got that figure from but a lot of people died about 100,000 or so the lucky ones were sold into slavery and dispersed so you didn't have any you know big clumps of Jerusalem residency going to one place together. They were just spread out, probably given the worst jobs in the worst places. It was a deliberate destruction of the temple cult. That's uh, so the, the people who, the sort of aristocracy, the priesthood that run that, had obviously uh, made a strategic error when they uh, decided to go toe to toe with the Romans and they were systematically slaughtered. You know, uh, anyone, those sort of aristocratic families, you had to run a long way to, to escape the reach of the, the, the Flavian kind of cult. There's some very interesting theories about who might, who might have gone where at this time, because clearly anyone with any sense would have got the hell out of Dodge. But that's not something that I, I can speak to because it's not uh, well documented. As well as destroying the temple, the, the Romans seem to have gone out of the way to destroy, destroy Jewish scripture as well, like copies of any of their books. I mean, were, you know, you could get killed uh, for owning copies of these books and they were burnt everywhere. So there was obviously an attempt not just to wipe them off, you know, just to, there was a serious attempt at 
not just genocide, I'm trying to think what the word would be if for destroying a religion, but you know, the Flavians weren't fucking about, let's put it that way. Um, about 10-15% of the empire was Jewish and they'd failed to integrate in this whole monothe monotheistic, we've only got one God, no, we can't have other, you know, uh, statues or icons in our temples would have been a real <laughs> stick in the, you know, been a real problem for the Romans for a long time. It's about this time that, you know, what's called rabbinical Judaism got started off, you know, people sort of meeting in a much less, um, in a very sort of, let's say, just more informal way, uh, still practicing their faith, but not, you know, not everything being based around the hierarchy at the, um, at the temple. Now, this was one of the most destructive wars the Romans had had, like, you know, um, and it, it wasn't. It, it didn't it didn't do the job uh, we're not going to talk about this but 70 years later there was a second jewish war where if anything was more violent and desperate than the, the first one the second jewish war was when was the emperor hadrian got so pissed off with the you know the, the judean people he renamed the 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 province from judea to palestine and he did that he renamed it palestine to try and wipe the jews off the map now it was obviously quite a lot of resonance there with what's going on today in a you know it's often been a very very hotly contested area for a very very long time and people are up for changing names and trying to wipe people out of history the uh, flavians did the best job that they could but like i say 70 years later there was another jewish rebellion against the romans and that one was even more uh, yeah there's certainly more people killed anyway well this is a uh, Big cult, big cultural war. So people were really, really, really getting cancelled here. It's not just snowflakes. And the sort of novel thing you could say about Jesus, about the only novel thing. I mean, he had lots of stories told about him, but the real innovation was his pacifist, his pacifism, which you could, you know, there's a lot of similarity or inspiration maybe taken from some Buddhist thought that was, you know, who been in um, in the mix, let's say, in Egypt and the uh, Near East for a long time, people were aware of Buddhism. And so it seems that um, Josephus and other figures around Vespasian concocted the story of Jesus of Nazareth to make him into this pacific figure. This is completely at odds, completely at odds from what people at the time were really, you know, Jewish people at the time were really wanted. They wanted all their messianic figures have been warriors and conquerors. I think the first uh, messiah sort of figure in the Bible is a guy called Cyrus, who was actually a Persian uh, emperor, king, and he'd come in and save them all from their captivity in Babylon. But all the messianic, messianic figures were kind of warriors who set you free. That was, that was the model. I mean, there weren't at that time in the Bronze Age and, you know, Iron Age, there weren't many people who, who, who freed you using nice um you know pomegranate juice or something like that you needed a sword so all the masonic figures were warriors this photo here is of an image composited from what's called the copper scroll um that was found you know dead sea scrolls this was one of those dead sea scrolls um and they're linked as most people know to a, a sect of judaism called the ascends who were you know quite austere and kept themselves apart from the life at Jerusalem. They thought all of that got a bit corrupted. Their Messiah figure was a warrior and they, they called him the teacher of righteousness. And he, he was quite a, he'd kill people. Uh, he was very judgmental. He would kill Jews for not being Jewish enough, which is, you can, as you'll see, something that the, um, quite a few people did. But this was the, the scroll, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is obviously, um, well, uh, uh, this is uh, historical and an historical find of uh, of relevance to to, to you know the, who Jesus was. So, this copper scroll uh, scroll was found and then eventually opened and translated by a guy called John Marco Allegro, who was a professor of um, you know an expert in Semitic languages at Manchester Uni University. As you may well know, um, these scrolls and other things found that. The Dead Sea have been these been very controversial. There's been all kinds of attempts to get them published, and then people holding things back. And although they were found in 1946, it's not entirely clear, but they were mostly published, let's say, in 1991. So 
people were sitting on them for a very long time. And it's, once you see what John Marco Allegra and other people who saw the scrolls and translated the scrolls, once you see what they said, you can see why people weren't keen to, <laughs> to share because it kind of blows a hole in um, a lot of the Jesus myth. Um, so this is him quickly showing you this because he was a serious academic. And it's amazing, like, <laughs> what he very bravely, he followed the evidence and came to some remarkable conclusions, but it kind of didn't help his career. Uh, so he was a lecturer in uh, comparative, comparative Semitic philology, philology, you know, like how languages are set, similar and different. It was in 1955, the scroll was <coughs> sent to Manchester you know, University so they could read, cut it up and read it. In 56 and 58, he wrote books about it, 60 as well. Uh, skip to the end, he, he said that the, all the content of the Dead Sea Scroll coming as it did from about the first, you know, say year 100 to maybe 150, they reckon, roughly, there's no Jesus. It's just obvious, he said, from the content that there wasn't this guy going around taught, teaching essentially in a Buddhist manner. The only <laughs> figures that Allegro could identify in the scrolls were very much in the warrior monk. He went a lot further and deeper. Stories of early Christianity, he said, originated in SN, the, the SN's cult around the use of psychedelic mushrooms. Jesus was a mushroom, that trope. This is the guy, professor of, you know, very, very, very learned guy. Um, read the Dead Sea Scrolls and just have it. He, he's got no ax to grind here. Allegro was not saying, hey, let's all take mushrooms. He, he never touched anything like that in his life. He was not, um, you know, trying to be, <coughs> trying to make Jesus rock and roll. He identified in the language the preponderance of mushroom terminology. He argued that the Jesus in the Bible was a kind of encoded, sort of poetic way of telling people all about the Amanita Muscaria and that Christianity was the product of an ancient sex and mushroom cult. You can imagine uh, he that. Those conclusions were not popular with the Catholic Church and everyone else. Allegro eventually said, he, you know, it became his mission, as far as he saw it, to destroy Christianity because it was all based on lies and bullshit and obfuscation. And um, that didn't, you know, you might well, you might not want to argue with him about that, but it did destroy his career. He really, really um, stuck to his interpretation of the facts. Now. He wrote this incredible book that I have read and I'd really recommend to anyone who uh, just loves how crazy reality is. Um, it's an incredibly um, learned book. He, he, he shows you stuff in you know, Arabic, Semit, um, Akkadian, Sumerian, Babylonian, Ugaritic. I mean, there's, he, he knew a lot of ancient languages and uh, he uses the similarities and differences between these ancient languages to, to tease out the meaning. So the SNs used Amanita Muscaria as a Eucharist instead of like having bread and wine, they, they had mushrooms and that's how they saw God or became God, depending on how you look at it. Now, he highlights the importance of the Sumerian language as a sort of mother tongue of lots of other Semitic languages. There's an, anal an analogy with Latin in the modern day, you know how lots of languages spring from Latin. Well, languages in that area took their roots from the Sumerian. There's the whole Semitic language thing of having a three consonant root. It's all, they all derive from Sumerian as the earliest language. Now, using that knowledge of these uh, meanings and links that Sumerian offers you, there are hundreds of coded references in puns in the SN writing, what are called Pesherin, kind of double meanings, and this is a big part of what Allegro does. He looks into these and says, well, I'll, I'll show you one in a minute. But so many of these things happen, these pesher and these puns, these coded references, that the idea that it was um, not deliberate is just ridiculous. i never really thought of it before, but when I read this book, it just made me reflect on, you know, the fact is we all got kicked out, you know, the fact is that the story goes, we got kicked out of the Garden of Evil because of, Garden of Eden because of fruit. Um, you know, we all hid and suffer for eternity. God's punishing us because of a piece of fruit. It's it's a weird, weird 
setup, I would suggest that probably originally the um, fruit of the tree of knowledge was not an apple. You were being told not to eat this stuff because it could make you like a god and that wasn't good for you. Something along those lines. Anyway, rather than, you know, the, it being bread and wine and you, you transubstantiating into Jesus or whatever the Catholics say, back in the day, people to see God would, would take something a bit stronger. In the cult of mythraism, they'd take some kind of, I'm going to say hallucinogenic, psychedelic potion. There was the Kaikian, which is what was taken at Delphi. And Ambrosia, the food of the gods, were, were all drug references. Just like in the Jewish religions, sometimes the priests didn't want any, wanted the, the priests wanted to keep the mushrooms for themselves, you could say. Uh, so they made them taboo. And very similar things happened in other cultures. In uh, ancient Greek culture, priests said you shouldn't eat anything, re anything red. Don't eat anything red. Not lobsters, not strawberries, and definitely not red mushrooms. Uh, Robert Graves suggests that they knew very well, or they, they created that taboo on eating anything red to keep the mushrooms for themselves. Uh, active ingredients of muscimol and ibotenic acid. Um, effect of this stuff is kind of... In, and it can be an intense euphoria. Quite well known is um, you know, people we call Vikings. You know those people would would um, use mushrooms as a way of let's say prepare, preparing for battle. It's quite a weird story, but they'd probably get their special friend, maybe the uh, <laughs> I don't know how you want to put this, but the guy who everyone else picked on to eat a load of mushrooms and drink a load of beer and wine and stuff, and you know they collect that guy who'd eaten all the mushrooms uh, piss and drink that. And that's apparently how, the, you know, the Vikings, whatever you want to call them, got into these sort of berserker. They, they performed incredible works, incredible feats of strength and endurance. You know, the, you know when you read about them, well, when I read about them when I was a kid, you just think that can't be right. No one's running that far or kidding. You know, it's mental. When they're all off their tits, it makes a bit, bit more sense that they, um, they performed incredible acts of, Barbarity, strength, and endurance with a high off the uh, Amanita Muscari can sort of give you a sense of elation of you know super abundance and confidence. And they took that with them when they went hunting and pillaging. So it's uh, quite a pokey drug. <clears throat> Going back to the Ascends, who were more out of towners, there were the Zealots and the Sicari, who were radical Jews. The Sakari were so named because they went around with knives that looked a bit like that and just stabbed people who weren't Jewish enough. Leaders who were talking about compromise, anyone who was not, you know, completely committed to hellfire and kind of Armageddon were enemies of the Sakari, enemies of the Zealots, and quite a few of them, like I said, you know, whilst Jerusalem was under siege, the Romans didn't have to kill anyone because the Zealots and the Sakari were doing it for them it's pretty clear that these people were divinely inspired. They'd seen God in the, the Amanita Muscaria and they couldn't help themselves but share, share, their, share the good news that they, that they had, which was, it's the end of the world, you know? Um, so the, not just the Ascends, other people used Amanita Muscaria and, um, you know, a bit like the, uh, the Vikings, they, they, did, they didn't come, they, they came wielding a sword. Again, uh, it is a remarkable book and it did get a massive, um, it was called the most controversial book since Darwin's Origin of the Species when it came out in 1970. Got absolutely shot down, as you might imagine. He, it, it did for his career completely, this book. It, he did not give up though. Uh, but I read a copy of it because it was, it was discontinued. The publisher, you know, it was hard to get a copy, a few hundred quid maybe to get an original 1970 copy but 40 years after the copyright uh, expired 2010 this came out some really really nice stuff at the end because basically uh, there's a lot of Allegro's work at the beginning was kind of uh, innovative let's say but people have gone back and sort of cross-referenced a lot of his philology you know his, his linguistics and there's a lot of corroborating evidence at the back the people who published this version of the book were supporters of Allegro and have gone to town supporting his claims. And I just wanted to show you one of these sort of Pesherim punny things that really, really made sense to me because I don't get why, you know, there's all these weird episodes in the Bible, you know, um, 
But there's this one particular episode where a guy called Simon gets called Peter, because of course, you know, that makes total sense. And there's there's a pun involved. Now the PTR root root petra root in Latin, you know, petrified means rock. It relates to rocky things, stony things. But in the Semitic languages, going back to the Sumerian, the PTR relates to mushroomy type things. So words with the PTR consonants in it will have something to do with mushroom uh, in Semitic languages. So in Matthew 14, uh, you know, the, on the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea and straight away Jesus spoke to them, be of good, good cheer, is I be not afraid. And, and Simon, because that was his name, said to him, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come Peter. And when Peter was down or out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, what kind of Peter is this? This is a Latin Peter. It's going to sink like a stone because it's a rock. But if it's a Semitic Peter, PTR, it's going to float like a mushroom. And the, the, uh, just before this incident, I think in the Bible, there's the bit with John the Baptist's head being on a platter. There are all these sort of weird incidents that sort of happen very episodically that uh, John Marco Allegro says, well, look, this is really clearly a pun alluding to mushrooms. And you get pun after pun after pun after pun, incident after incident after incident after incident. And there's no continuity in the inc incidents, but there is a continuity in the punning. And he, he, he really, I mean, this is a few hundred pages of really going to town on the, the linguistics of it all. So lots of people point this out. It's one of those things, you know, once I read the, you know, I read the uh, Allegro book, it, it, you suddenly see it everywhere. But there are loads of mushroom references in Christian art, uh, going all the way back to the Middle Ages and before and since. Uh, Jesus was a mushroom, you can get the T-shirt. Bring me the head of John the Baptist, you get me the T-shirt, because, you know, uh, this has become a trope. And actually, it was the work of John Marco Allegro and his uh, tenacity in publicising it all that really made it part of, you know, um, popular culture. You can say fringe culture, whatever you want to, you know, the fact we all know about this is really down to him. Uh, oh, and him. Because <laughs> the other, per another person who was invited to look at the Dead Sea Scrolls was someone uh, I really had lo loved the work of. He's a guy called Robert Graves. He famously wrote I, Claudius, which is amazing. But he was a classical scholar. He, he, you know, he was the guy who knew every god in the Greek pantheon and who, you know, <laughs> who did what to whom. He had an absolute encyclopedic knowledge of classical culture and was a, an observant Catholic. So he was invited to see the Dead Sea Scrolls too. Not aware of him really hanging out or interacting at all with John Marco Allegro, but he just said, yeah, this is all about mushrooms. And again, his work about the Dead Sea Scrolls was kind of, he was politely asked to keep it quiet. He, he was more amenable to that than Allegro. But he came in and he writes about this. In, uh, the first time I came across this he is in a book of his called The White Goddess. And he just said it was just so obvious. Everywhere you looked in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were talking about mushrooms. I mean, I don't know what he saw there. I, I can't read the languages and that. But this is interestingly, completely independent corroboration of the idea. Now, Graves is very clear that once he read about it, rather than uh, Allegro going around trying to destroy, destroy Christianity, his attitude was, well, why don't I just try some of these mushrooms? They sound interesting. So he described a feeling of supreme and, and, uh, illumination and generally speaks about them in a very positive way. He was very high class, I'm going to say, quite a posh guy. And he hung out with some very, very posh people in New York. And he told them, you know, check out this about the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're all into mushrooms. And he hung out with a guy called R. Gordon Wasson, who had worked for, was a, was a banker, made loads of money. And it was R. Gordon Wasson who really broke the psychedelic uh, movement in those posh, fashionable circles of New York, just like the hippies in London were really in the 60s were just posh people in Chelsea who could afford everything. It was a bit like that in the 50s in New York, kind of thing. Posh people tried these 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 different mushrooms. Watson was married to a Russian lady. They had, whereas in English we've got two or three words for mushroom, like you know, mushroom, fungus, and postal. Apparently got like hundreds of words in Russian for mushroom. And 
They started to <laughs> investigate mushrooms, went to South America, tried psychedelics there. And it's just really interesting, isn't it? That the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you can, you know, draw the dots. That it's the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls led to the psychedelic revolution in the 60s and 70s and led to a lot of people becoming a lot harder to govern. That, I would say, was the major effect of people doing uh, psychedelics. They start thinking for themselves a lot more. And um, it's quite remarkable that uh, a few old bits of metal and parchment in a cave in some jars in <coughs> northern Israel, Palestine, whatever, led to us all knowing about all this kind of stuff. I mean, the psychedelic revival it has certainly made all this much more popular. There may have been some very, very narrow and elite group of people going back all the way through history who knew about this, this mushroom culture and the different religious and philosophical things that went with it. But really, it became popular as a result of the Dead Sea Scrolls and Robert Graves talking to Wasson and Wasson um, popularising it all across America. So... I want to go back to sort of Hawksmoor's time, having spoken about mushrooms and all of this kind of thing. Like, they looked at, um, you know, in Hawksmoor's time, they were trying to be scientific. They looked at everything Roman with a lot of, super, uh, a lot of sus suspicion. It was clear to them that the, the story that the Romans had sold about this guy, Jesus, walking around being nice to everyone was just clearly a lie. And they were looking around for what was true about religion, you could say. What could they hold on to? So entheogens the way of you know taking drugs to see god was seen as superstitious and a great example of this is uh, st john the divine the guy that wrote uh, revelations he, he was fasting for 40 days during wormwood the stuff that's in absinthe and he was doing that uh, for 40 days chewing on wormwood not eating not drinking and then he started getting inspired and it makes a lot of sense out of what is otherwise a completely mental tirade of bizarre imagery he was off his tits when he wrote it makes sense to me in that as the amanita muscaria as we said um connected to the ascends and the sicari and probably the zealots you also find very clear mushroom references references in the book called the fairy queen written by edmund spencer for elizabeth the first so many fairy tales are really <laughs> drug stories um uh, the list writes itself father christmas lots of people point out uh, the similarities between sort of Siberian shaman cults that use the red and white with the Amanita Muscaria and Father Christmas, very well trodden path. As um, already mentioned, the Vikings used Amanita Muscaria, probably the Knights Templar, well, no, the Knights Templar and uh, the Ishmaelis, the followers of Hassan ibn Sabah, uh, kind of known as the Assassins. All these people used Amanita Muscaria. So this sort of tradition of entheogens, whatever you want to call them, was viewed as superstitious by Hawksmoor and his fellows, um, or his friends. I wanted to mention the 1516 Reinheitsgebot, which is when the German law became, you can only use water, barley, yeast, and sugar, or whatever the hell. Um, what that meant was anyone who brewed their own beer was no longer to put, uh, allowed to put any more interesting additives in there. You can look this up, but there was quite a tradition of people, you know, having small breweries at home, women with big cauldrons who keep cats to keep the, you know, the grain rat free would brew these things up and, you know, use their imagination to make the beer or the, the, the drink more interesting. And after the 15, 16 line height, Gebot, uh, the, the, you know, it was a kind of a, a top down arrangement that, you know, women brewing beer was not a good thing. They were kind of you know, uh, characterised as witches and not to be trusted, and we should only have beer that had beer in it, and none of the more interesting ingredients were allowed anymore. So, um, I want it for me. This is all <coughs> about for me. I was looking into all of this, trying to understand it to get a perspective on Hawksmoor. And really, uh, I, I've got to say, Hawksmoor was around or shared an office with and spent a lot of time with one of the most prolific and committed drug takers I've ever heard of. And that's the guy, Robert Hook, who was, as well as uh, Christopher Wren's best friend, he worked, he worked with, um, Hook worked with Wren and Hawksmoor 
in the uh, Office of King's Works in the, in the build-up and, and the aftermath <laughs> of the Great Fire of London. Hook was kept a diary and he was a really, really, really keen self-medicator. Um, there's a story of a guy uh, going to India and coming back with the first consignment of bang, which was a, some kind of hash or, you know, some kind of cannabis product. And Hook made friends with a guy, and I, I should have got the quote, but there's an hilarious quote of him explaining to the um, Royal Society all the effects of bang and what it did and what it didn't do, made you forget, made you hungry. He ate, he, 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 he laughed a lot, he fell asleep, he got back. I mean, he just had a crazy time. But it was all right because he was doing science. Yeah? Same when he was doing laudanum, opium, you know, uh, opium with sherry, do that like there was no tomorrow. Big on cocaine, you know, he said, oh, it's great, you can have a bit, you, you can work for hours, you don't have to eat anything, you know. He was, <laughs> he was all over it. He died young, Hook, and he died, he was very messed up. And um, this is a guy who was Hawksmoor's mentor and kind of, yeah, a bigger boy. When Hawksmoor moved to London, he didn't know anyone. Hook was one of the people Hawksmoor hung up with the most. I wanted to show you this uh, entry from his diary, and I've, I've, I've managed to swipe the date off it. Anyway, one day he took volatile spirit of wormwood, that same stuff that, uh, you know, is what they put in uh, absinthe, which made me very sick and purged me in the morning. Drank small beer and sal almanac, which is some kind of, um, I think it's got mercury in it. And I purged five or six times very easily. This is certainly a great discovery in physic. I hope that it will dissolve the vicious slime that hath so much tormented me in my stomach and guts. Do is, do is, do, you know, God, God prosper. I mean, he, he was there. Uh, Hawksmoor did not keep a diary of his drug taking. If he was anywhere near Hook, which he was for 20 years of his career, he was around someone who was very committed. And I'm going to show you almost spiritually committed to his, his, his drug taking. It's interesting to note as well that in Hook's diary, he says uh, he went to see um, Christopher Wren, but he was very sick that day because of taking physic the day before. We don't know what he means by physic. It could have been wormwood, it could have been opium, it could have been cocaine. They called the medicines they applied to themselves physic, and you know <clears throat> they all had a they all had a medicine cabinet of some quite exotic things. Uh, so, a uh, point for me was I was establishing that it was pretty clear that Hook, Hook and Wren were keen on their physic and the hawks more it'd be very strange if they didn't you know pass you know uh, share their enthusiasm with their apprentice i wanted to show you this because robert hook really is the uh, embodiment for me of what a scary a scary a scary person a, a very intelligent and incredibly malicious person who was obviously incredibly deluded uh, and had a massive ego or something thought he was something special Anyway, it's a great prerogative of mankind to be cleverer than other creatures. That's that first bit. But, um, and it is this peculiar privilege of human nature in general. So it is capable of being so advanced by help of art and experiment as to make some men excel others in their observations and deductions almost as much as they do beasts. So I've got so clever using art and experiment. I'm a smart you know, as smart as men are with beasts, I'm smarter again than them. By the addition of artificial instruments and methods, I wonder what he means there, there may be in some manner a reparation made for the mischiefs and the imperfections mankind has drawn upon itself. Taking drugs yeah, and doing these experiments makes me stronger, smarter, more godlike than other men. He saw, he really didn't believe in other people being his equal. He really did believe in his own superiority in a way that fits uh, really very tightly with that whole kind of psychopathic, sociopathic, whatever you want to call it, nut, nutcase with a chip on his shoulder from his childhood who would do anything to get a, a jump on other people. So Robert Hooke was almost religiously, he's talking about God and all that, almost religiously committed to his physic and getting insights and you know, almost, uh, you know, empowering himself to almost a divine level. And he did some horrific things. So you can say for Hawksmoor, it's pretty clear, there's probably no Jesus, but there was some kind of Christ. Going right back to the beginning, there's no Jesus of Nazareth in Josephus. It's pretty clear 
from their understanding of history that the Flavians uh, were the, the, the Christianity was the Flavian family business. Yeah, and really tellingly, he, he Hawksmoor said that, you know, Flavius Constantine, Constantine the Great, he was a Flavian, in, held, held the Council of Nicaea in 325. And that's where, you know, the Hawksmoor's contemporaries really thought the Romans put their stamp on things and there was nothing genuine about Christianity after that date. So Hawksmoor built his churches based on Basilica from before 325, from Christian buildings before Constantine had put his stamp on it. And I, I should, I guess, I want to mention here, people go, on, oh, oh, the Romans, didn't the Romans persecute the, um, the Christians? No, not really. There was a guy called Diocletian and a couple of other figures in authority who Diocletian was one of four emperors at that, that time. They'd split the empire up into four parts by that time. But some leaders and some people did persecute the Christians. None of those people were Flavians and the Flavians normally came in, replaced that person and you know, the Christians were treated better again. Uh, to start with, the Christianity that the Flavians were involved with was very much an aristocratic enterprise. People would become Christians to show that they were, you know, they're going to be good friends to Rome. It was also pretty clear that Vespasian was very inspired by Serapis and the reason for his, that God's creation was very strong, very obvious. I think going to go from now Jesus to Christ. There was a strong Egyptian influence um, on Vespasian and the whole thinking behind Christianity. The Ptolemies have been there for hundreds of years. Aristocracy, aristocracy at Alexandria was very sophisticated, had developed a very clever way of um, running things. And they were interested in you know, what we can, what you could reasonably call mystery religions. So you got not a, there's no in Hawthorne's mind now there's not a Roman Jesus but there is an Egyptian Christ because it, it, it is bizarre to me that Christian scholars still try and argue this point but clearly there's so many coincidences between the you know uh, between the life of Jesus and the life of Horus and the fact that the life of Horus has been you know versions of his life story written thousands of years before Jesus. To try and deny this is just stupid, but you know, that's religion for you, makes you believe or do stupid things. Horus had a miraculous birth at the Winter Saurus. He is a dying and rising god. He overcomes evil in the person of his uncle Set. There's a kind of cult to his mother, Isis. Uh, you know, in the afterlife, your soul is judged. Him and his dad are seen as triumphant kings, they sort of live in an immortal realm. And, you know, it's a mystery religion. It's verbal, not written. I mean, obviously hieroglyphs and stuff are written down, but a lot of the emphasis on Roman, sorry, Roman, Egyptian spirituality, the Egyptian Christianity, was more, much more internal. And I really, this is the story. Yeah, I love this story. Um, it really comes from Plato, but it really kind of helped me understand the, the thinking. So Thoth, this guy here, spelt Thuth here, is showing a king called Thamus all the different things he's invented because Thuth Thoth was, you know, terribly, terribly clever. And it comes to this. But when they came to let us this, said Thuth, will make the Egyptians wise and give them better memories is a specific both for the memory and for the wit. Thamus replied, oh, most ingenious Thuth, the parent or inventor of an art is not always the best, the best judge of the utility or inutility of, its, of his own invention to users of them. And in this instance, you are the father of letters from a parental love of your children have been led to attribute to them a quality which they cannot have. For this discovery of yours will create forgetfulness in the learner's souls because they will not use their memory, but they will trust to external written characters and not remember of themselves. So there's a sense in which you could say the written word when you're talking about you know, religion or spirituality or whatever, becomes like a false idol. If you write something down that becomes fixed and permanent and external to you, and it's something you have to obey, somehow you could say, but if you internalize things, you don't have to rely on anything. And it's just a different emphasis on religion because the sort of Egyptian Christianity morphed or developed into a strand of it, into what's called hermeticism. And this is more of an oral tradition, much 
yeah, in a way you don't write things down because certain things can't be put into words. And if trying to put them into words kind of crushes their subtlety. Hermeticism is a philosophical system that is based on the purported teachings of a made up figure called Hermes Tris Trismes Gaitis, and the legend, a legendary Hellenistic combination of the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Thoth. So you can see here, we've got another one of these combinatory gods. Hermes was, yeah, like a, a mythical figure. People, yeah, without a sense of irony, wrote books about him and his oral tradition. Work that out. You can read a lot of books, uh, supposedly by Hermes Trismegistus, who was meant to be the, who was meant to espouse an oral tradition. So what he was doing writing books, he must have forgotten what he was doing. Also out of Egypt came St. Anthony, the father of all monks. This Egyptian form of monasticism had a big impact, not so much in Britain, but on Ireland. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Anthony was the sort of opposite of um, a, a social Christian. He went out into the, you know, went out to the wilderness and developed himself. It was a personal thing. And this is 180 degrees from the, the kind of religion the Romans wanted, which was social conformity. You go, you obey, you know, you, it's a very performative religion, Roman Catholic, Roman Catholicism. There's a lot of things for you to do. They don't, they don't focus so much on what's going on in your head, but more how you how you act in the social in the social sphere. Now, Renaissance Hermeticism was a kind of you know, just this chain of thinking going through the ages it came up it's all produced all kinds of interesting stuff now this little code here i will admit I, I i didn't write and i haven't translated it all so if it says hail satan in it i'm sorry but thought it might be fun for people to have a look at this is a code i've come across in other contexts yeah but there, there was all this work was internal it, it, it didn't matter you know if you're a hermit how you looked you know, how badly you smell, how many teeth you had, how rich or poor you were. It was working on the inside was the emphasis. And then people came up with incredible works of the imagination, trying to make up, make sense of the world and make sense of their part in it. I think that I really like this, um, this particular mandala, whatever you want to call it, this sort of world map thing. You've got God in the middle. So G-O-D, power, wisdom, love. So threes, mother, father, son, that's threes. And then you've got a square, north, south, east, west, earth, wind, fire, uh, water. So you're going to fours. Then for some reason you go to the zodiac, so you've got 12. That's the heavens. And then the days of the week are seven, and they relate to the seven metals that they thought they were. And lastly, you've got the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So someone's trying to organise, they get in their head, a mind map of the of everything that's in the universe, you could say something like that. I, I wanted to point out, uh, it might seem like I'm being a bit of a smart aleck, but one of the reasons why there's in some languages seven vowels and 22 consonants is because seven over 22 is a really good approximation for pi. And I imagine that's what this person was alluding to with this. Yeah, so this her hermetic tradition Produce all kinds of really, really interesting works of the imagination, you could say. Uh, people who were just going around obeying the Ten Commandments didn't go around painting the Sistine Chapel. It was people more into this kind of stuff who produced the interesting art and science. Uh, yeah, so there's this particular setup uh, of um, imagery that is particularly powerful and interesting and was relevant, I would say, to the Masonic and Hermetic thought processes that Baltimore was involved with. Uh, this uh, picture on the left is taken from the Book of Kells, which is, I think, 8th century book of Irish calligraphy and religious writing. There, for whatever reason, in about the 8th century, there was an incredible outbreak of um, literacy and culture and incredible artwork and stuff that came out of Ireland. People, especially English people or like, you know, snobs or whatever, try and contextualize it in all kinds of ways. Oh, it's just the Irish getting lucky for a couple of weeks. Something really remarkable happened. That if you ever get to see the Book of Kells, it is an amazingly beautiful thing. And 
why I wanted to mention it is because it's not just a pretty picture. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Matthew depicted as the man, Mark the lion, Luke the ox, and John the eagle. And they're also, not coincidentally, they are... They also represent the four corners of heaven. The Aquarius is Matthew the man, uh, you know, the lion is Leo, the, the bull is Taurus, and the eagle is Scorpio. Often in, uh, you know, in antiquity, Scorpio was depicted as an eagle, not as a scorpion. So you've got in that cover, you've got, I want to say a map of heaven or a map of the universe. There's something more going on than just these four images. They come together to tell you about the turning of the the heavens, you know, astrology into astronomy, that kind of area. And it's just very, very beautiful and very worked in. All of these details on each one of these icons had meaning. And it was like a mandala. You were trying to make sense of the world, I guess, by producing these works of art and then thinking about the connections and the intricacies of how the world or the universe works. You can see that later on the... Tarot, sort of, you're going to say early Middle Ages, the tarot kind of pops up in forms. But this more modern card I thought would be familiar. And you've got the, you know, you've got those four um, beasts again in the corner. You've also got the I, let me get this right, the JHVH of um, the name of Jehovah in uh, Hebrew. You've got all the tarot going around. And on top, you've got a sphinx. And interestingly, if you get the Sphinx is the you know the face of the man, the body of a lion, the legs of a bull, and the wings of an eagle. The Sphinx is a kind of a composite of these four. You know, and you see Sphinxes all over the Middle East as being sort of symbols of time and you know, again, kind of a synthetic figure. And underneath there's the devil. This triangle on the right has got the JHVH. I don't know quite why people have put this math down the bottom, but the point I wanted just to share was that this dividing things up into four, tetramorph, tetragrammaton, was a, a very, you know, very common way of drawing, if you like, these mind maps, these maps of heaven. Um, and I'm going to show you one of those now. So this is now going back to the thinking that I'm going to say Hawksmoor was doing. Um, you can see if you check out Doth, which a lot of pe people uh, interested in masonry and the hermetic tradition did, he does an awful lot of things that are very familiar. Because, for example, uh, he, he heals Horus's eye by touching it, spitting on it just like Jesus. And there are some more interesting parallels as well. Because this eye plays a really, really, really important part in, let's say, Egyptian culture and thought. I mean, you know, everyone's seen the, the eye of Horus as a, an icon, has all kinds of different meanings, but I wanted to share this story with you because I think it's really interesting and really cool and kind of seems to relate or have, have informed a lot of what Hawksmoor thought about this stuff. Story goes that uh, Seth, the guy with the black head up there at the top, was fighting Horus. Horus was trying to take back the throne from his evil uncle. And it was a sort of classic good versus evil battle in the battle. Um, Horus has his eye gouged, gouged out and it falls on the ground. Uh, as a result of that, Seth is starting to win this battle of good versus evil. And, Hor um, Horus is struggling. So Sloth goes around and he tries to find Horus's eye. Uh, first of all, he finds a half of it and he realizes that isn't enough. Then he finds a quarter of it, then he finds an eighth of it, a sixteenth, um, you know, 30 seconds, 64. Keeps on finding smaller and smaller bits and he can't quite put it back together again. At some point, he goes, You know what? This battle's too important. And he just gets the, all the bits he's got, puts them together, spits on them, and chucks them in Horus's face. And, you know, like by a miracle, the eye works and Horus defeats his uncle Set and good conquers evil. So right in this battle, metaphysical battle between good and evil, the reconstitution of the eye by Thoth is seen as, um, you know, tipping the balance between 
chaos and order of good and evil. And um, the eye played an incredibly, uh, well, had a, a really interesting use. It wasn't just a story, it was the basis of a lot of Egyptian mathematics. They wouldn't, they'd have an awful trouble, I think, Egyptian parents, let's say, if they had three kids, because they, they were rubbish at dividing by three, or, you know, any number that wasn't, um, comment, you know, wasn't a half a quarter or a sixteenth or an eighth. They, they stuck very rigidly to their fractions and their, their mathematics, and it made dividing things into three particularly <laughs> problematic with them. So as an Egyptian parent, if you had, I don't know, 20 miles bars and three kids, um, you, 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 you blow your mind. If you had four kids or two kids, you could do the maths very easily because you practiced it. But they used halving to talk about fractions, as you can see on the left, and they used doubling to do um, multiplication. So just to quickly explain, you got 25 times 32, you get 32 and you double it, 64, double it, 128, and so on and so on and so on, and so on as, as high as you need to go. And then you make the numbers in the left-hand column add up so the number you're trying to uh, multiply by. So in this case, 25, so that's 16, 8, and 1. You get the, the values next to 16, 8, and 1, and they add, add up to 800. So you got, um, this is this story of how the Eye of Horus was integral to the battle of good versus evil, but went a lot deeper for the Egyptians. They used it as the basis of their mathematics. And you can see Thoth is getting a lot of credit here not only did he invent letters, but he's invented maths as well. And you'll notice on this left-hand image, they've labelled touch, taste, hearing, thought, sight, and smell. I thought that was, well, let's just say I kind of just took that with a pinch of salt when I first saw it a few years ago. It's true to say I've been studying neuroscience now for a couple of years, a um, uh, private clinic. I'm, I'm taking it very seriously, and it's very complicated but what's remarkable what's kind of, this isn't me who noticed this but actually the way the Egyptians label the eye of Horus so this bit's to do with smell this bit's to do with hearing it's very accurate it, it, it's really very quite it's really ties up very well with the workings of the brain and you know heaven fuck knows how they know that all this stuff but for example they say um Hearing is that little bit behind the eye, and that's where the auditory cortex roughly is in the brain. I'm not saying that you can use this as an anatomical diagram, but it's a really good cartoon. And the association with horse and the brain, you've got the inner bird, which is the brain stem. They call that the inner bird. That's uh, it's called sort of the midbrain or the mesencephalon, and you've got the uh, cerebellum, that little bit that looks like the wings. And you've got the eye of horse, because if you cut a brain in half and you look at just the inside half of a hemisphere it does look like an eye so very very clearly and in a lot of detail in some remarkable anatomical ways the eye of Horus is to do with the imagination and, and the, the say consciousness uh, and that blew me away I'm, I share it because I think it's interesting now we've got here what I've done I've put the eye right on the right on the you know, intersection of the cross, and in, in there you've got Horus, because Horus was the sort of balance of the elements. He's the, the king who, you know, with Thoth's help, manages to keep everything well managed and everything ticking over. His father in heaven above him is Osiris. He's associated with the north, with winter, with midnight. Osiris is, is the sort of embodiment of forces of order and growth. He's green. Um, people who've watched other ones of these will know that he's associated with barley. This is a lot of the story of Isis and Osiris is really about how to create, uh, how to grow crops and create a sur surplus. To his east, I'll say, is his mum Isis associated with spring and dawn. She's a, a sower and a, a binder, you could say. Um, beneath him is his evil uncle Set, who's the south, summer, midday, chaos and destruction. The, the Egyptians associated midday and summer with destruction because it was so hot. Um, Seth was sort of said to live in the chaos of the deserts, and they were always trying to keep the chaos at bay. Finally, there's Nephthys, who's the West, associated with autumn and the dusk, and she's a kind of reaping and a, a brewer. A lot of the more interesting Egyptian concoctions, you could say, were associated with Nephthys. Um, she, you know, uh, she's associated with the autumn and uh, that sort of part of the process where 
uh, maybe fermentation, you could say, is happening. And I put the um, image of Thoth there because he's the kind of, if you like, he's the, the man standing behind the throne, whispering to Osiris, making sure everything's going according to plan. And that image from the Book of Kells, because really that Christian iconography, the tetra, tetramorph and so on, it, it really has clear, <laughs> very clear pedigree in Egypt. And again, it, it, it's, it's strange that Christians still disavow this connection because it's so obviously there. You've got this cyclical worldview. This is a kind of a my really cartoonish depiction of uh, an Egyptian's mind map with these concepts and how they um, relate to each other. So Hawthorne built only 12 churches, or rather he built only six. 12 were built under the 50 Churches Act. This is me coming back again. I guess this whole thing comes back to me with my interpretation. I think he was trying to be cute and put the pieces of the Eye of Horus back together in a kind of a symbolic way over London. There is a little video uh, where I explain what I think he was doing and why he compulsorily purchased bits of land in the different places he did. I wanted to show you the westernmost church, the one labelled four on this map in Bloomsbury. Um, if you look at the image to the right, that's William Hogarth, who was an admirer of Hawksmoor's um, picture, Gin Lane. Uh, you can see under the pawnbroker's sign, those three bulls, there's a really, there's a man standing on a pyramid in the background. That's Hawksmoor's church that we'll look at in a second. It, it's just the weirdest church people call it the weirdest church in the world i think that's a fair description i'd really recommend anyone who if you're ever going down to the british museum for example it's just down the road from there go and check it out it's just it's just weird i mean i'm not trying to be um i don't know how else you want to put this it's a very anomalous building and uh, this for me was trying to understand what the what, what we was doing was really part of why I sort of delved into all that stuff like I said never read Joe Cephas the original but I did read people who'd read it if you like and just trying to understand why Joe Cephas was so important to Hawks more because he spent all this time with Albridge and why there was no Jesus in any of his churches they just it's, they're, they're Christian churches but they're not like <laughs> anything else you'll see so this particular church, unlike I think any other church, certainly in England, is orientated north-south. Every church is orientated east-west, every single one. It's just, I don't know, I, I knew that when I was, you know, it's just how churches are done. But no, no, I'm having this one north-south. Why? What he thought he was symbolising? Don't know, but he, people noticed that he'd built the church at a 90-degree angle to the wrong, and people... He paid a heavy price for it. People thought he'd gone mad. People criticised him. By the time this church went up, I'm pretty sure Wren was, yeah, Wren was dead. And he was, Hawksmoor was all by himself. Hook was dead. He was a Tory in a, a Whig town trying to put up Tory churches. And I think some people just said he went a bit mad. He certainly suffered from a lot of psychological stress. Yeah, and this, <laughs> this church is the result. Orientated north-south. Don't know why. Well. It, very, very, very strange to do that in a Christian church. There's no crosses on it. You can't see any, you know, basically, if, you know, people live around here. I knew a woman who lived just around the corner. She didn't even know it was a church. Uh, you know, it looks like a library, or I don't know what it looks like, but it doesn't look like a church. Uh, yeah, you could say, well, some people did say it's more like a pagan shrine. On the left here, you've got the really very, very strange spire you can see that's not jesus at the top that's george the first except he's 10 foot tall and <coughs> incredibly thin because <laughs> uh, george the first was a bit rounder than that you've got a, a lion and a unicorn fighting each other at the bottom of of the of this step pyramid so now the lion and the unicorn famously obviously uh, the sort of animals on the royal coat of arms he is talking about there in stone the fact that the Stuarts have just been kicked off the stone, they're re represented by the unicorn. The Stuart family was the family that introduced the unicorn to the crest of Great Britain and all that sort of thing. Versus the lions, George I on top there, his family had been invited over 
to take over from the Stuarts. He was 57th in line to the throne. And people like Hawthorne just had no time or respect for that. They hated the Whigs. They hated the fact that uh, the Whigs had brought in this foreigner. So you got the King of England, or Britain, sorry, on uh, the top of a step pyramid where lions and unicorns are fighting each other. I mean, work that out. I mean, the, the, the step pyramid is clearly based on the mausoleum at Halicarnassus. It was, it was King Mausolus or something like that, wasn't it? It, it, it was one of the wonders of the world. That, that picture down the bottom, it was a step pyramid with, I think, a chariot at the top or something like that because this guy Mausolus liked his chariots. This is an explicit echo, this tower, this step pyramid of the mausoleum at Halicarnassus. So uh, why would you do that on a Christian church? Well, I, you know, it's because I think he'd lost all his bearings at Hawksmoor. There was no Jesus. The whole crucifix thing was bogus. What, what, how do I build a church? I don't know. I'll tell you what, I'll stick a, I'll stick a step pyramid and some unicorns on it. That'll be, that'll be Christian. People took the mickey out of him endlessly for this. It's, it's, people still do. Actually, in the Victorian era, they went, had someone go up and chip off the, the lions and the unicorns so they are no longer there. But recently, the lions and the unicorns have been put back. And there's a particularly weird story when the unicorn's horn was about to be put back. They got all the kids from the local schools to form a, to hold hands around the, the church building and they passed this unicorn horn from child to child to child to child. And it's just all a bit weird. I think it was the Duke of Kent who was there presiding over this ceremony. And he's like the chief Scottish right Freemason in the country. Some weird shit went down. They, for some reason, got kids to pa pass the parcel with the unicorn horns before they stuck them back in that, back on that church bar. It's a, it's a weird building. Go and check it out. And I guess all of this was a way of trying to contextualise why someone who was trying to build a Christian church would end up making something so odd. Um, Bloomsbury was also the um, parish church of the first of the squares of London. Now, you know, there's Berkeley Square, Fitzroy, Belgravia, lots and lots of these squares. This was the first one. This was um, Bloomsbury Square was the first, I think it was the Earl of Southampton got it built. You know, people point out the Masonic, uh, well, just, Square is a big thing in masonry. People living around squares and the nice part of town was an innovation and this was all very much part of it. Uh, Bloomsbury, where this church was built, was the most, probably you could say one of the most sophisticated and cosmopolitan places in the world at that time. They had all the money and they had all the goods and services that were on offer anywhere. Yeah, I'm just gonna leave you with these two little quotes, both, from the son of the then Prime Minister, uh, Robert Walpole, was the Prime Minister, his son, Horace Walpole, said, when Henry VIII left the Pope in the lurch, the Protestants made him Henry the, the head of the church. But George's good subjects, the Bloomsbury people, instead of the church, made him the head of the steeple. <laughs> so the son of the Prime Minister was going out of his way to, to go, what, what is this? Um, I, he also called it a masterpiece of absurdity. All I can say is that this is not like any church you'll ever see anywhere else. And the fact that Hawksmoor had clearly through Aldrich's translation worked out that there was no Jesus and that the Roman religion was a lie set up for imperial and political reasons kind of left him and his disconnected because they had, you know, what, what do we do now? Well, what you do now is you make crazy looking buildings like that. That's what, how Hawksmoor responded to the fact he discovered his faith was based on, you know, was not based in, was not, had no basis in history. Yeah, and um, I highly recommend anyone uh, checking out all of these churches because they're all equally, they're all very odd. Uh, this, none more than this. So. <laughs>